So our topics for the day, uh, introduction to radio access network, okay. Um, run and OSI layer. Uh, next is the run architecture, different run architectures, and then what is open run, okay. And the three G GPP hardware and open systems. And then we'll discuss the uh, open run ecosystem and some deployments and trials. And we'll end this with key learning points. Okay, so let's start with the introduction to Radio Access Network. So what is Radio Access Network no? or RAN? So to set, to set stage, so let's start this uh, brief overview of what RAN is and its role in the telecommunications ecosystem. Okay, so Radio Access Network, these are uh, commonly known as uh, cell sites. Okay, so these are strategically placed provide wireless coverage to users within a specific geographic area. And you can see it all around you. Okay, you can see it everywhere actually. And the placement of radio access network or run components such as the cell site is critical to ensure that uh, users have reliable and consistent uh, access to the network services they need. So when you're planning the deployment of radio access network, uh, network operators consider various factors such as the population density, okay, topography, uh, building density, and traffic patterns um, within the coverage area. So by analyzing these factors, network operators can determine the optimal location and configuration of front components to ensure maximum coverage and uh, capacity. So like for example, in urban areas with high population density and building density, uh, network operators may need to deploy more cell sites with lower output power to provide coverage to smaller areas. While in some rural areas with lower population density, uh, network operators may need to deploy fewer sites with higher output power to provide coverage to larger areas. So the placement of radio access network uh, also affects the overall network performance. As you can see, uh, we need to put a lot of cell sites in different parts of the Philippines, uh, like for example, just to provide uh, seamless coverage and mobility. Okay, So we need to be strategic in placing this uh, uh, radio access network. Okay, so this is the radio access network. Now let's see the mobile network coverage. Okay, network now. So we need to put a different uh, uh, radio access network in different places. Okay, because the output power of this uh, uh, radio access network or cell sites is just uh, in a typical, like for example, from the radio, typical is 20 watts, 40 watts, or 80 watts in some extent. No? That's why the coverage is uh, very limited compared to a broadcast station. Okay, and the tower height of this uh, radio access network, probably the highest might be 50 meters or 60 meters in, in height. Very frequent, you can see uh, 100 meters of a cell site. Not un uh, unlike uh, the uh, broadcast stations, which you can see around 100 meters and then transmitting at a higher power rate. Okay, so you need to put a lot of cell sites in different parts of the country to create a seamless coverage. Okay, so thousands of radio access elements create seamless coverage and mobility. So whenever you want to go from one place, from Manila, going to Pampanga, so you will have a seamless uh, coverage. You will not uh, make a drop call. Okay. Okay. So... Wireless telecommunication system components are composed of uh, three main uh, parts. We have the user terminals. So the user terminals, these are the user equipment uh, for 3G, 4G, or 5G. And uh, also a mobile, st mobile station if you're using a 2G. Okay. So um, the examples of these are user terminals uh, such as smartphones, uh, tablets, laptops, and other mobile devices that are equipped with wireless connectivity features such as 
the cellular from 2G to uh, 5G. And then uh, the user terminals are connected uh, to the radio access network or RAN. So the RAN is responsible for providing the wireless connectivity required for mobile uh, devices to connect to the core network and access the services. So the radio access network includes um, different parts of, uh, of antenna system, uh, radio, and the baseband unit. No? So we will discuss it later. Okay. So these uh, two are connected via air interface. So we are using a wireless connectivity. We are using a different uh, frequency, set of frequencies. We call it the radio frequency. Okay. And the radio access network is also connected to the core network or the CN. So the core network is responsible for managing the overall operation of the network. So it includes routing traffic between different uh, networks and providing advanced services such as voice calling, messaging, and data services. And there are different means to connect uh, the core network and the radio access network. So um, these are connected uh, via microwave wirelessly or physical cable or fiber optic. And uh, if there's a challenge in terrain or uh, large distances, and then you are limited by the curvature of the earth, you will use a satellite okay, to interconnect these two. Okay. So this is the main components of a radio access network, of a wireless telecommunication system. You have the user terminals connected to the radio access network and core network. Now let's focus on the radio access network. So radio access network, <clears throat> this is the one, uh, this is the part of, um, of a wireless telecommunication system that uh, nearest, that is nearest to the subscribers. Okay. You see it all around you. Kahit saan, pwede mo makita to. Uh, you can see it in the malls. You can see it on uh, mountains, rooftops, uh, wall-mounted on a building. Okay? And the location is widely distributed. So you can uh, see it everywhere. And since it is uh, transmitting uh, not uh, um, um, high power, uh, thousands of front elements uh, create seamless coverage and mobility. Okay. So RAN is all around you. Okay. Have you ever stopped to think about um, how your mobile device or cell phone is able to connect to the internet and make calls and text while you're on the go? It's, uh, it's all thanks to radio access network that's all around you. Okay, so next time you're out and about, take a look around you. So you'll likely see cell towers and antennas on top of a building, okay, or along the side of the road, or uh, uh, even in the mountain or even inside the malls. So this uh, type of antennas, okay, are inside the malls. So we call it the in-building solutions, okay? So when you look at... Uh, uh, outside the mall, mamaya makita nyo, no? uh, meron tayong mga antennas like this. So some people, um, napagkakamalan nila yung uh, Wi-Fi access points. Okay? But it's not a Wi-Fi access point. No? It's an omnidirectional antenna or sometimes an active antenna uh, that belongs to a radio access network. Okay? So if you uh, take a look on the overall architecture of an IBS, the IBS is... Uh, looks like this no so if uh, you will have a building like this uh, you have a ground floor or second floor the equipment are located uh, most of the time uh, either in the ground floor basement or on the rooftop or roof deck so you have this battery unit the cabinet the transmission unit and the remote radio unit and what is uh, unique in the indoor system uh, like what you are seeing inside the malls these are using uh, distributed antenna system or DAS. When you say distributed antenna system, um, just imagine the electromagnetic energy is being distributed 
equally or almost equally in every parts of the building. It's just like a water sprinkler, right? So you have a source of water supply and then you separate those uh, water with different uh, tubes and sprinklers. But this time, the water is now uh, an electromagnetic energy which is invisible to our eyes. Okay, so this is uh, what we call the distributed antenna system. Okay, so when you look at this, so there's an electromagnetic energy radiating in uh, from these uh, omnidirectional antennas and also from these directional antennas. So this is how um, the typical uh, in-building solution works. Okay, so this is not a Wi-Fi access point. So these are cellular network. Okay. Okay, so um, let's go back to the radio access network. So since radio access network are uh, are uh, with us uh, in the long from very long time already, almost uh, forty years already, uh, specifically here in the Philippines, uh, we'll take a look at the evolution of these uh, mobile communications. Can you imagine uh, a time when mobile phones did is, didn't exist? Wala tayong mobile phone. No? So we are um, strapped in, inside the house and then we're just waiting for the call of our special someone. There's a landline. Okay. <laughs> we cannot go outside. Uh, it's hard to believe now, but not too long ago, communication on the go was limited to radio and landline phones, as I mentioned. So that all changed with the introduction of 1G, okay, or first generation mobile communications in the 1980s. So 1G was the um, first mobile phone technology and used analog signals to enable basic voice calling. And these uh, early mobile uh, phones were large, as you can see in the picture, and expensive, and the network coverage was limited. But despite its uh, limitation, um, 1G laid the foundation for the mobile revolution that was to come. Next was the 2G, uh, or the second generation mobile communications. 2G was introduced in the 1990s and enabled basic voice and text messaging services. The famous, most famous killer application, actually the killer application of uh, 2G, specifically here in the Philippines, was the SMS or the text messages. Okay, uh, where we became the text capital of the world you know, when they launched the GSM here in the Philippines. There was uh, statistics that uh, states that uh, there was a 100 million SMS per day is generated only in the Philippines. And that is equivalent to 100 million pesos that time because one SMS that time was uh, one peso. Okay, unlike now, we have unlimited, okay? <laughs> but during that, uh, in time, in 1990, one SMS was equivalent to one peso. So you're very fortunate today. You can text unlimited, <laughs> okay? All right, so then uh, came 3G or the third generation mobile communications. 3G was introduced in early 2000 and brought uh, faster data speeds. Uh, enabling more advanced services like mobile internet, uh, video calls, uh, multimedia messaging. So, data sumikit yung mga video calls. No? But for most of the Filipinos, uh, don't want to adapt that technology. That's why the video calling was not, was not uh, so successful that time. Because, uh, you know, no? if uh, for, for professionals, and then somebody will call you and then they will see you somewhere. So they don't want, <laughs> they don't want that kind of uh, invasion of privacy. You know? So video call was not so, so successful that time. But the, the, the one that has been uh, successful was the uh, introduction of the smartphones. Okay? Smartphones. Especially when uh, iPhone 3G was launched. Okay? So that was the uh, era of uh, the start of the era of the iPhone, okay? And, and, and if you look at this, um, 2G has a data services already. We are using GPRS and Edge 
if you can if you if you will look at your phone if you see a g in your phone that means you are connected um uh to the network using a gprs okay probably it's uh, around 56 kbps in speed and edge could give you around 100 kbps or 300 kbps top but uh, when 3g came uh, it improves to up to 1 or 2 mbps okay until uh, it evolves to 14 mbps to 21 mbps to 42 mbps okay so from 2g it's a kbps era 3g is the mbps era <laughs> and then the 100 mbps came in 4g okay so or the fourth generation so 4g was introduced in the 2010s and brought uh, even faster data speeds uh, better network capacity and more reliable coverage so 4G enabled advanced services like streaming video, okay, because the throughput is uh, um, now higher up to uh, 10 Mbps, 15, 20, up to 100 Mbps. Okay? It enables us to do online gaming and mobile payments and pave the way uh, for the Internet of Things or the IoT and other emerging technologies. Okay? So the most famous there is the LTE. Okay, the long-term evolution. And now we are in the era of 5G or the fifth generation mobile communications. So 5G promises uh, to be even faster and more capable than 4G with data speeds that are up to 100 times faster than 4G. So if 2G was in kbps, 3G is in mbps, 4G is the 100 mbps, 5G is the start of gigabit per second. Okay, so uh, you can see also in our existing operators that they can meet the one gigabit per second using a speed test in their commercial networks. So 5G is expected, not only that, to enable uh, new and innovative services like augmented reality, autonomous vehicles, and smart cities, and to transform the way we live and work. And if you saw the previous Apple um, commercial, I forgot the name, Apple Vision Pro, right? So they are already preparing that uh, augmented reality uh, glasses. Okay, so, but cost a lot, no? <laughs> okay, so it will also, um, a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, um, technologies will also emerge together with this 5G technology to support the ecosystem so there you have it uh, the evolution of mobile communications from 1g to 5g so each generation has brought a major advancement in mobile technology and we can't wait to see you know what the future holds okay so uh radio access networks also has different generation names okay so have you ever heard of uh jiran or UTRAN, or EUTRAN, and NGRAN. So these are the na different names for the radio access network, or RAN, that are used in different generations of mobile communications. Uh, for example, in GSM, uh, GSM Edge radio access network, we call it GRAN, okay, okay, GERAN. For the 3G, we call it the UTRAN, the UMTS Terrestrial Radio Access Network. For LTE, we call it the EU trend or the Evolved Universal Terrestrial Radio Access Network. And finally, for 5G, uh, we call it NG RAN. Okay, so next generation RAN. So you can see the RAN has its own name for every generation of cellular mobile uh, telecommunications, but all have the same working principle. Okay, so. Now let's move on to the RAN components, okay? So what are the different RAN components or the radio access uh, components? Uh, you can see here the simplified architecture of, uh, of a wireless network. So you have the core network, okay? You have the radio access network here composed of the BBU or the baseband unit and the RRU or the remote radio unit that uh, composed, oh, that com com composed, no? 
uh, of radio access network. And then you have the user terminal here. Just forgot the user terminal here. <laughs> okay, we had this, uh, there's a UE here, user terminal. Okay. Okay, so if we uh, look at this in the physical world, so there is a physical structure that supports the radio access components, okay, such as the antennas and cables. So the tower structure, the tower structure is uh, designed to be sturdy and stable even in high winds and extreme weather conditions. If, you're, if you will talk to a civil engineer, um, they will uh, tell you uh, how much or how strong uh, the tower in terms of uh, how it can sustain the speed of the wind. So th there are towers that can sustain up around 200 kilometers per hour uh, of wind. Okay, so you can ask that to a civil engineer. So meaning the towers are being built by civil engineers, not ECEs, okay? <laughs> so next, there's the antenna system, okay? So the antenna system is responsible for transmitting and receiving radio signals between mobile devices and run components, okay? So we call this the reciprocity, right? In the, uh, in the antenna um, characteristic or properties. So the antenna, um, uh, typically made up of multiple, and uh, the antenna system is typically uh, um, made up of multiple antennas uh, placed at different heights, okay? So we have different heights and different types of antennas depending on the specifications. So there are antennas uh, with high frequencies um, as part of the uh, uh, best practices in the industry. Uh, we put it on top. So to um, minimize the loss and then maximize the capitalize no, the antenna height so it can propagate fast farther than uh, uh, almost equal no but sometimes it's not it's not so so we are doing that in the in the industry so there are different specifications of the antenna depending on the frequency and depending on the applications okay so there are uh, high gain antennas and there are twin beam antennas but it, it is not part of this uh, uh, um, discussion points, okay? And then there are uh, remote radio unit or the RRU. The RRU is a critical component of uh, RAN system. It is responsible for converting the radio signals received by the antenna system into digital signals that can be processed by the BBU, okay? So the RRU is typically located on top of the tower structure near the antenna system to reduce the uh, transmission loss, okay? And RRUs also are frequency specific, meaning um, there are certain radios that uh, functions only on a specific band, like 1800 megahertz, and some radios operating at 900 megahertz. Some of the advanced radios right now, uh, they are operating at dual band, so they can either operating at 1800 megahertz or 2100 megahertz or 700 megahertz and 900 megahertz. Okay, so if you're new in wireless telecommunications, just think about this remote radio unit as radio, typical radio. So here's your FM radio and this is your AM radio. Okay, so some, some of the uh, applications are the same. Okay. Now, these uh, remote radio units are connected uh, via cable, uh, connected to the antennas via copper cable, okay? And uh, connected to the baseband unit by a fiber optic cable, also known as the Common Public Radio Interface or the CPRI, fiber optic cable. So CPRI is uh, used to transmit so it's a standard protocol used to transmit the digital signals between the RRU and the BBU. Okay, so this is the RRU and this is the BBU or the baseband unit. So it ensures that the signals are transmitted quickly and efficiently without any loss or degradation in quality. Okay. <clears throat> and then we have the BBU. Okay, so BBU is another critical component 
of the radio access uh, system. So this is responsible for the uh, digital signals received from the RRU and transmitting them to the core network. So this is the BBU. So is uh, this one is responsible for transmitting the, the signal going to the core network. So meaning, um, um, together with the BBU, we have the transmission uh, network. So the BBU is uh, commonly found inside a cabin or an enclosure like this, where the power supply is located. Okay, ventilation. Okay, batteries and transmission unit. Okay, so the transmission unit in this example is the microwave, okay, or wireless. So wirelessly, we are connecting the radio access network to the core network here. Okay, so meaning uh, this mic, this is a microwave. Now. So you have the core network here connected. Okay. So there you have it, um, a closer look at the different components of a typical uh, run system from tower structure to uh, transmission. So each component plays a critical role in ensuring the mobile uh, devices can connect to the wider network and access the services uh, they need. So no matter where they are or where they go doing. Okay. Okay, so in uh, actual uh, installations or applications, so this is how the RRU looks like. Okay, so these RRUs are what we call the proprietary. Okay, so when we say proprietary, so there are uh, um, components and the protocols there that are not uh, open. So you cannot just interconnect an RRU to a different BBU because the, pro the, the protocols are different. That's why we call it proprietary. So this is uh, how the RRU looks like in real uh, applications or the applica ap uh, practical applications. Okay. And uh, the CPRI, okay. So the Common Public Radio Interface. Uh, this one is uh, that one that enables the high-speed transmission of uh, data over a fiber optic cable, allowing the RRU and the BBU uh, uh, unit to communicate with each other, okay? So this is the common public radio uh, interface. And also the BBU, as I mentioned uh, earlier, BBU are, is typically uh, located uh, below the tower. And this is responsible for processing the baseband signals and placed in the equipment room and connected with RRU via optical fiber. Okay, yeah, there you go. So that's uh, our first topic about uh, introduction to radio access network. Yeah, let's continue our discussion. Uh, run in OSI uh, layer, okay. Okay, so the run system is often divided into different layers. Okay, so each of which is responsible for different aspects of the system. Uh, one common way of conceptualizing these layers is through the Open Systems Interconnection or the OSI model, which is a conceptual framework that describes the communication functions of a telecommunications or computing system. Okay, so the OSI, okay, OSI. Uh, uh, model is a set of concepts that describes and standardize how a computer or telecommunication system uh, communicates, regardless of how it is built or what technology it uses. Okay, so yung ating OSI layer, if you can still remember, uh, we have seven layers. Okay. Uh, each of which represents a different aspect of communication between devices on the network. Okay? So, meron tayong iba't ibang layers dyan. So, yeah, I hope you still remember the OSI model. Can I get a thumbs up? If you still remember the OSI? If you still remember your professor? Who taught you the OSI layer? 
Meron pa ba nakakaalala dito ng OSI layer? So, let's have a quick run-through, no? So, meron tayong physical layer. Okay, so ito yung layer responsible for the transmission and reception of raw data over a physical medium, such as the copper, okay, or fiber optic cable. And then we have the data link layer uh, responsible for reliable transmission of data over a shared physical medium using protocols such as yung Ethernet or Wi-Fi. And then we have the network layer uh, responsible for routing. Uh, data between different devices on the network using protocols such as the IP or the MPLS. And then meron tayong transport layer responsible for ensuring reliable and efficient data transfer between devices on the network. Uh, ang gumagamit ating protocol dito is the TCP or the UDP. And then we have the session layer. Okay, So this layer uh, is uh, used for establishing and managing um, communication sessions between the devices on the network. Nandito mga protocols like RPC and NetBIOS. And then we have the presentation layer responsible for formatting and presenting the data to be transmitted over a network, katulad ng mga ASCII or JPEG. And lastly, meron tayo nung application layer uh, responsible for providing high-level services and applications to users. Mm -hmm such as yung email, web browsing, and voice calling. Okay, so each of these layers plays a critical role in the operation of a radio access network system. So enabling mobile devices para makakonect to the wider network and access the wide range of services. <clears throat> so um, if you mapped it no, sa radio access network, yung ating OSI layer, um, and then you will divide uh, these layers into the main divisions ng radio access network natin, like the radio unit and the baseband unit, you can see that the layer 1, 2, and 3 can be found in these components, the radio unit and the baseband unit. And the other uh, layers can be found in the other parts of the network. And then sometimes uh, it's uh, fi uh, we find it uh, hard to memorize no itong mga uh, sequence no apply nung ating mga model no ng seven layers so we have a mnemonics na ginagamit dito so we have the seven layers mnemonics so if you're starting from the application layer down to physical layer all people seem to need data processing okay all people seem to need data processing so application presentation session layer transport network data layer and the uh, physical layer but if you're in the philippines we have a different mnemonics right and the mnemonics that uh, we use most of the time can you type in <laughs> so ano na no uh, especially yung mga suki niya no, na Asia Open na Academy, alam na nila. Okay. So, in the, in the Philippines, we have a different set of mnemonics. Uh, and if you're, if you're in abroad, and if you want to share it to your colleagues abroad, uh, you say it, uh, ang police sa tulay na dipa. <laughs> Ganun na pagkakabigkas, no? Ang police sa tulay na dipa. Okay, yeah. So you will sound uh, foreign also. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay, so, so that's how uh, we memorize the mnemonics of the OSI. So kailangan na tandaan dahil pag pinag-usapan na natin yung run splitting mamaya, these three layers will be very critical and important. Okay. Especially when we are talking about different configurations, different network splits. Okay. These three are very important. Okay, especially of all also if you are in the radio access uh network or engineering department. So this uh, the analysis most of the time are uh done in this uh, network layer and the physical layer, okay? Okay. Uh now uh let's map no uh the run in the OSI layer here. Okay. So you can see 
Um, ah, sorry, no. Uh, let's uh, start it here. So these are the the this is the table of the OSI layer and then mapping the radio access network layer. Okay, as mentioned, the run um, mapping to the OSI layer uh, falls in these uh, three uh, layers: the network layer, the data link, and the physical. Specifically, if you go for the run, okay, uh, the radio access network has different protocols, but the protocols can be mapped into the OSI uh, layer. Like for example, the RRC, the radio resource uh, control, okay, protocol, it can be mapped in the network layer. The packet data convergence protocol and the radio link control and the uh, media access control can be linked in the data link. And the air interface can be uh, in the physical layer. Okay. So later we'll discuss what are the functionalities of this RRC, PDCP, RLC, MAC, and the physical. So let's go back to the um, uh, interconnection no, of uh, the radio access uh, components. So, Kanina, uh, you will become aware that the UE or that user terminals is connected to the radio access network, right? This is the radio access network. And then you have the core network, okay? So if we focus on the radio access network, there is an antenna system. It could be passive or active antenna system. But if you go for the RF part, the RRU, the remote radio unit, okay? So this is where the physical layer can be the, can be seen. So the physical layer consists of the RF conversion. Okay, so the modulation and the modulation is happening here, analog to digital and digital to analog. The BBU performs a lot of tasks. Okay, so that's why it's one of the important part. Okay, so the BBU holds this RRC, PDCP, the RLC, the MAC, and the physical. So what are the uh, these uh, protocols. No? So the RRC or the Radio Resource Control uh, uh, protocol is uh, responsible for broadcast, paging, connection management, mobility functions, measurement configuration, and reporting. So a you know, uh, typical example is that um, um, whenever somebody is uh, calling you, uh, the network needs to be uh, to page you para hanapin ka network. So it uses the RRC protocol. Okay? Before mag-ring yung telepono mo, no? it will be page muna. Hahanapin ka muna kung nasaan ka. Okay? And then the PDCP, the Packet Data Convergence Protocol, okay? Um, it's um, responsible for the IP header compression, okay? And security. So it includes yung ciphering and integri integrity protection. And then once na lumagpas yan dito sa PDCP and then yung RLC, kung pababa tayo, uh, we, co we go to the radio link uh, control protocol. No? So this is where the segmentation. Pinaghihiwalay na natin yung mga headers no, na galing sa PDCP. Okay? And then kung uh, malaki yung data, we have to concatenate no? or segmentation or concatenation. Meron tayo mga automatic uh, repeat request Okay, kapag may mga errors tayo na detect and duplicate detection. So dito nangyayari yan sa RLC. And for the MAC, um, the medium access control, uh, nandito nangyayari yung multiplexing. Pinagkasama natin yung mga logical channels dito. If you're familiar with the carrier aggregation, this is where the carrier aggregation happens. Sa MAC layer. Okay? Nandito rin yung mga hybrid automatic requests channel mapping, and then packet scheduling, and then yung mga quality of service. And uh, yung pinaka-bottom na part is yung physical layer. Nandito yung mga error correction, yung mga cyclic uh, redundancy checking. Uh, coding, okay? You are the adding bits to the uh, uh, packet no? or to the to the existing bits no? para magkaroon tayo ng redundancy. And then yung modulation, so, dito na papasok yung mga 16 QAM, 64 QAM, or QPSK, okay? And then the modulation, and then you will be uh, doing the resource element mapper. So, if you have this uh, resource element, 
like for example, if you're using LTE, so there is a, what we call the resource element mapper and the inverse fast Fourier transform. Okay, so this is where uh, na the best, uh, best uh, illustration of the run and the OSI layer mapping. Okay, so if you look at this in the table again, this is where the RRC, the network, the PDCP, RLC, and map, the data link, and the physical is here. Okay. Okay. So that is the uh, run in OSI layer. Now we'll go to 5G. Yeah. So in this module for 5G, uh, we'll discuss about uh, this technology and we'll learn about different use cases. Performance targets, uh, different techniques, the GPP roadmaps, architecture, and then uh, 5G protocol stacks. Okay. So why it's important to learn 5G before the open run? Because most of the uh, uh, applications of the open run uh, will be implemented here in the 5G, including LTE pa rin. No? Pero meron mga, meron mga vendors that are implementing open run in the all G, no? uh, meaning uh, includes 2G, 3G. But uh, most of the uh, operators or vendors are focusing on LTE and 5G. And as you can see also in the previous uh, presentation from our uh, yes, uh, lecturer, um, in 6G, uh, Open Run is also uh, one of the key technologies. No? So what is 5G? So when we talk about 5G, 5G means uh, fifth generation. Okay, Fifth generation, 5, pang lima, G is the generation okay, of wireless technology. And this is the latest iteration of the mobile network that we use to connect our smartphones and other devices to the internet. Meron tong tatlong use cases. Okay, tatlo. Three major use cases. Enhanced mobile broadband or EMBB. Enhanced mobile broadband. MMTC, Massive Machine Type Communications. Okay. And ultra reliable and low latency communications or the UR LLC. So, sa mga technical interviews, palaging tinatanong to. Okay. What are the three use cases of 5G? So, you just have to remember these uh, three uh, use cases, major use cases enhanced mobile broadband, massive machine type communications, and ultra reliable and low latency communications okay all right so sir how do we simplify the explanation of embb so when we talk about embb okay when we say embb enhance mobile broadband it only means higher capacity and faster throughput okay like gigabytes in second okay so gigabit per second 1 gigabit per second umaabot na si 5 dron Okay, gigabytes in uh, storage. Okay, the sobrang bilis ni 5G, you can also stream or watch in the 3D video or ultra high definition screens. You can also work and play in the cloud. Okay, that's the main benefits of EMBB. Actually, this is the first uh, use case na we experienced when 5G was launched here in the Philippines. We experienced faster. Um, throughput and higher capacity. Okay, so when we are talking about EMBB, we are talking about capacity and throughput. So kapag tinanong kayo sa kahit anong interview, so when you explain simply yung EMBB, so that's higher capacity and faster throughput. Next is the MMTC. MMTC means uh, massive machine type communications. Ano yung massive machine type? So meaning uh, millions of devices connected to the network. Ano yung mga yon in simpler terms? That is what we call the massive IoT or the Internet of Things. So 5G has the capability to connect up to 1 million devices per square kilometer. So ganun karami ang devices that we can connect to our network when you're using a 5G, especially if you're using 5G4 network. And with these use cases, you can uh, implement different applications like smart city where you can even connect wireless camera 
okay, wireless CCTV with HD, no? high definition uh, uh, videos. You can also connect your smart, uh, smart home or buildings, smart elevators, smart escalators. Okay, so everything that can be connected will be connected using the IoT devices and using the 5G network. So we call that use cases as a massive machine type communications. Not also this, no? Um, yung mga devices natin sa mga production lines sa industry, we can also connect that. Um, smart port, yung mga ports natin, yung mga PR, okay, we can also connect that to the, to the network. So that is uh, what we call the massive machine type communications. When we talk about ultra-reliable and low-latency communications, ultra-reliable, meaning it's very or extremely reliable. Ano yung sabihin ng extremely reliable? Hindi ito basta-basta nagda-down. Up to 99.9999% of the time. Okay, so if you calculate that in one year or in one day, it's just like a millisecond downtime. Halos di mo na uh, experience ng downtime. Okay? And low latency communications. Meaning na low latency, um, instant response ng network up to milliseconds. One millisecond ang target ng 5G. So, ultra-reliable, hindi siya basta-basta nagda-down, and fast response or instant response ng network. What are the different applications we can use using the URLLC? Self-driving car. Okay, so if you're driving uh, uh, an advanced car right now, like for example, powered by ADAS, okay, advanced driving assistance system, may ADAS system ka, no? So currently ngayon may mga cruise control lang, di ba? And then lane, lane assist. But this time, the self-driving car, just imagine your phone or your mobile phone is equipped with four wheels and a steering wheel. No? Yeah. So, meaning, yung, 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 yung sasakyan or vehicle is now connected to the network just like your, your mobile phone, right? You have your SIM card or you have the eSIM or embedded SIM or integrated SIM of your, uh, of your devices. No? <clears throat> you can watch, uh, you can watch uh, entertainment uh, uh, movies in your car, okay? Uh, your car is also talking to different cars, okay? So we have a different topic for that. We call it the V2X, vehicle to everything, okay? And in common term, we call it the self-driving car. Okay? So the URLC is very important here. Why? Because um, there is a um, life at stake, you know, kapag ka nag-down yung system, it can cause... Uh, uh, loss of human lives or even accidents. That's why it's very important to have an ultra-reliable and low-latency communications. Okay? Um, we can also use it in mission-critical applications like e-health, industry automation, okay, and augmented reality. Okay? So you can see there is also an intersection of uh, each use cases. Okay? Intersection of the MMTC and the URLC. MMTC and EMBB and the uh, combination of three. Okay. Okay. So I hope this is uh, uh, clear. The use cases of 5G, the EMBB, the MMTC, and the UR LLC. Okay. Okay. So now let's uh, discuss some um, special, uh, no, not special, uh, 5G spectrum services and techniques. Okay, so 5G, <clears throat> 5G is the first uh, mobile technology. Okay, 5G is the first mobile technology <clears throat> that operates on a much higher frequency band with previous wireless technologies with frequencies up to one gigahertz. Currently, in the 3GPP specification, up to 90 or 80, no, 80 gigahertz, and up to 450 megahertz. So, ito lang yung technology ngayon na meron, yung, meron ganyang span ng, ng operating frequency. If you look at the existing frequencies like GSM, GSM in the Philippines is uh, just working in the 900 megahertz and 1800 megahertz. Dalawa. Dual band tayo sa GSM. 
In the UMTS or 3G, we are using uh, 850, 900, 2100. Okay, so tatlo. Three frequencies, no? Three, three bands. For the LTE, we are using marami na, no? Medyo marami na. 450, 700, 900, 850, um, 2100, okay? 2600, 2300, so almost 7 or 8. But in the 5G, you can see malawak yung frequency niya. After 450, using yung mga existing frequencies natin, sa 2G, 3G, 4G, and 5G, we can still use. Okay, we can still reuse that 5G. And then, uh, added they added um, additional set of frequency. We call it the FR2, the frequency range 2, uh, which, what we, which is what we call the millimeter wave. Okay, so it operates uh, at the frequencies above 24 gigahertz. Dito. No, hindi na tayo sa ano. So, millimeter wave. Okay. So, your millimeter wave communications enables us to use much of the larger bandwidths, up to 800 megahertz or more. Okay, so we can support the data transfer of up to 8, 10 gigabit per second or even 20 gigabit per second as uh, yung target ng 3GPP. No? Okay. Next is uh, we are using the beamforming. Yeah, so meron tayong beamforming na ginagawa no? sa, sa 5G. So beamforming uh, um, lets you to use a special type of antenna that has a lot of antenna elements and combining those antenna elements to steer the beam no? kung, nasaan yung, ano, kung nasaan yung mga subscribers. So it can steer vertically or horizontally or can improve the antenna gain no? kapag pinagsama-sama niya yung mga antenna elements. We call it the beamforming. And also, we are apply, apl, applying the massive MIMO uses the multiple antennas uh, on both the base station and the mobile uh, device no? para mag-improve yung signal quality and increase the capacity of the network. Okay. And then we have also the network slicing. Yeah. So network slicing. So unlike sa LTE last time na ang ginagawa natin is nagsasama-sama tayo, we are... Uh, um, using the core network or network as one, but this time we have a different slice. Okay, we have a different slice. So, what are the, those different slices? You know what? What are those? So, we have the slice for EMBB, we have a slice for uh, MMTC, and then we have a slice for URLLC. Hindi tayo magkakasama sa core network. Okay, so if you are using uh, EMBB or you're only down loading you are not mixed with the urllc users you are not mixed with the uh, iot users you have a different slice of the network you have a different virtual uh, slice in the network you are using the physical network but you have virtually different slice of the network so that's what we call the network slicing and then you can also you can imagine that like for example if you are very familiar with the apn access point number or name Okay, so sometimes, right, if you are using the internet and if you are techy enough, you check your iPhone or your Android and then you want to change the APN. In the 5G, you can do that also. And that also defines the, um, the network slice. So the network will immediately know if you are an EMBB user, URLLC, or a massive IoT or a MMTC user. Next is... Um, LTE, dual connectivity, and LTE coexistence. Currently, right now in the Philippines and in other parts of the world, um, the architecture that we have adopted so far at the early stage of 5G was the NSA. Okay, NSA. NSA means the non-standalone mode. NSA. Non-standalone mode. So when we talk about NSA, you have the LTE core network. We call it the EPC, Evolved Packet Core. So you have the core network of LTE. So currently, you have the LTE here. So because uh, in our country, LTE is uh, a mature technology. So if you want to deploy 5G in a faster way and efficient way, uh, what you need to do is uh, you have the 5G 
node be here or G node be here, you don't need to create a new core network. What you need to do is connect this 5G to the EPC and then connect it to the LTE as secondary node. We call it the secondary node. And then this will become the master node. Okay. So anything, any UE or 5G UE device cannot connect directly to 5G unless it will go first to the LTE and then the LTE will add the 5G as a secondary carrier. And then that's a time that the UE will have a 5G signal here. We call it the dual connectivity. Okay. We call it the dual connectivity. Meaning if you're looking at your phone right now and that is a 5G capable device and then you can see a 5G logo, your phone is connected to the LTE and 5G network in the same time. We call it the dual connectivity or the ENDC. Okay, So that's uh, one of the techniques that we are using right now. And of course, uh, cloud-optimized architecture. Okay, so in the cloud-optimized architecture, I'll just erase this one. In the cloud-optimized architecture, <clears throat> um, we can improve you know, the efficiency of the network depending on the application. Like for example, if we are apply, if we are supporting um, um, MMTC or uh, ultra reliable and low latency communications. Some of the components in our 5G network could be moved near to the subscriber to further lessen the latency. No, para ilapit natin yung, ano, yung part ng, ng, ng network na yun sa mga subscriber para mas bumilis yung latency natin. So that's what we call the cloud-optimized architecture. No? So nagbabago yung ating architecture. It's not a monolithic. That's why... When we talk about up and run as well, if we incorporate it to the 5G uh, techniques of uh, optimizing the cloud architecture, and then you have the up and run where you can also disaggregate the functionality of uh, each component, you can achieve itong cloud optimized architecture. Later on, we will we'll discuss it further. Okay? Okay. So far, so good? Can I get a thumbs up? Kung nandiyan pa? If I'm still talking to somebody here, can I get a thumbs up? Okay. All right. Okay. So if you want to learn more about 5G uh, and uh, you want to focus on the technical details of 5G, uh, the best place to visit is the 3GPP or the Third Generation Partnership Project. So the 3GPP, uh, they have their website, so that is uh, free. Uh, you can access the website for free, of course. And you can also download the specifications and the standards that you want to study, especially if you're working with the vendors or operators or suppliers, and then you want to uh, study the different protocols or the different standards and applications in 5G, you can just go to the 3GPP uh, website, okay? And then you can uh, browse, no? Yung kanilang website. You can see here, advanced plan for 5G. You can see here, what are the different plans? And by looking at this website as well, you can have an insight. What will happen? What might happen in the future? Um, tama ba yung mga pinagsasabi namin? Or are you in the right path in studying telecommunications? And what are the things that I need to learn to further adapt in the future? Okay. So if you look at the um, 5G uh, standards roadmap, uh, you can see a different release. Okay. So there's a release uh, 14, release 15, 16, 17, and 18. Release 15 is what we call the 5G phase one. So this is where the first 5G was uh, released. Okay. Currently, we are now in the release 17. And the release 18 is still ongoing. And the release 18, we'll call it the 5G Advance. Okay, 5G Advance. Okay, so you can see it in the timeline that as uh, that the, 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 the roadmap progress, no? it's going to 
what we call the 6G no pero but the uh, 6G uh, roadmap still not uh, uh standardized you know pero it's uh, already in the you know, in the plan and we're expecting it to be um um what do you call this standardized by the start of 2028 to 2030 okay so you still have very long way to study uh 5G right now and uh, if you master 5G and then open run and then when 6G comes in you're prepared okay just like uh, what we did in the LTE era when we first heard the LTE so we started to study LTE and then yeah when LTE came came here in the Philippines we are ready so we are equipped and then when you want to explore opportunities abroad um the LTE that we studied here the 5G that we have studied here the open run that we've studied here are also applicable abroad okay okay so now uh, let's uh, take a look at the <clears throat> um different control no different uh, different uh, 5G a uh, different uh, architecture of the 5G system so the 5G system architecture is uh Uh, divided into three major parts so we have the 5g core network okay so you you still remember no yung ating three main uh, three main uh, parts of the wireless telecommunications you have the core network right you have the ran right and then you have the user terminals Do you still remember this i'll show the the slide uh, this one Right? You have the UT, you have the RAN, and then you have the core network. When we talk about 5G, it still follows the same concept. Okay? Nagbabago lang yung pangalan and functionality, pero the, the concept is still the same. You have the core, you have the RAN, and then you have the user terminals. So the core will be called, uh, it's called the 5G core network. Okay? Or the 5GCN. And then the RAN is, uh, can be A 3GPP next generation run or NG run, so as I mentioned earlier, or a non-3GPP access network. What does it mean? It could be a wireless local area network based on a Wi-Fi or a non-3GPP interworking function. You can connect it to our core network. And the NG run, marami yun ato, no? marami siyang variations, marami siyang combinations. So we have a different um, um, architecture uh, for 5G implementation. You have the standalone new radio, standalone long-term evolution, standalone base station using NR, and then the standalone base station uh, and using LTE as the anchor. And then you have the user equipment. So when we talk about this, uh, different, uh, different uh, options of deploying 5G, ito yung pinag-uusapan natin. So you can deploy 5G in different uh, scenarios. You can deploy uh, a standalone 5G and non-standalone 5G. You can also mix the combinations of LTE and GRAN and the LTE EPC and the 5G core. So we'll uh, discuss it further uh, sa different sessions no? sa, sa ating uh, Asia Open Academy. Okay? Okay. So now let's uh, take a look no yung ating um, core net ay uh, yung ating control plane and user plane sa 5G. So in any system like for example LTE and uh, 5G we call, there is a there is a concept that what we call the SD SDN uh, software defined network. So the main concept of the software defined networking is uh, you are separating the control plane to the user plane. So for the ease of architecture and implementation So imagine we have the core network of 5G and then you have a G node B and then there is uh, communication happening between these two. There is a different traffic. So we have the user plane. The user plane is, um, this is where, um, this is the plane where the, it carries the network user traffic. So if you are downloading data, okay, you are downloading a huge file from the, From the from a certain server, and it will go in uh, inside your 5G core, and then before it goes to your user terminal, it needs to it will use the user plane. But before the network allows it 
to be downloaded, there are control planes, okay, that carries the signaling traffic. And like, for example, you are delivering something. You order something from Lazada, okay? You order uh, 1,000 pieces of uh, gloves. <laughs> I'm not sure why. <laughs> How, what, what is the purpose of those 1,000 pieces of gloves? No? So when it enters the, the security guard in your subdivision, it will not allow immediately, right? So there are control mechanisms. So sa tanongin niya ng guard, nasaan ka pupunta? Ano yung address? Okay, what is the address? Wa, sino yung tatawagan mo dyan? Sino yung tag-deliveran mo? What is the name of the recipient? And then uh, most of the time, if the guard is suspicious about the authenticity of the delivery because there's a lot of, of uh, packages arriving in your house, uh, they will call you no, for authentication. Okay, So that is also part of the control mechanism. So once the mechanism is uh, complete, satisfied, that's the time that the guard, security guard, will allow the delivery of your uh, products. Same thing also when you are uh, uh, withdrawing money, right, from the bank, especially if you're using um, a bank book, right? So before you enter the bank, so the security guard will ask you uh, probably what is your purpose of entering the bank. Okay, so if you either you will deposit or you will withdraw, then then if you're allowed to enter the bank, you will proceed to the teller, and then let the, if you would like to withdraw some money, like for example, you would like to withdraw 10 pesos <laughs> from the bank. So the the teller will not uh, immediately give you money, right? Uh, what she will do is just she will check the authenticity of your account. Okay, check the balance if you still have money. And then, uh, if uh, the, the 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 withdrawal is uh, is um, valid, okay, or acceptable. So, if all requirements are complete, that's the the purpose of the control plane. And the user plane, if the if the all the essentials or all the uh, thresholds are been met or parameters have, has been met or have been met, uh, that's the time that the user plane will open up, and then the money will come out. Okay, so that's the same with the with our network. Okay, so that's how the control plane, the user plane, are separated. Okay, so if you look at this, this is a uh, <laughs> uh, um, a deeper um, protocol stack. Okay, that we are uh, um, looking at in the five G protocol stack. So you have these, uh, like for example, the OSI layer stack. Okay. So you have the application, presentation, session, transport, network, data, physical. If you map it in the 5G network stack, so you have the application of service, open transport protocol, upper network, lower network, and open wireless architecture. So this is the 5G network stack. And if you separate the user plane protocol and the control plane protocol, maalala nyo to, si SDAP, PDCP, RLC, MAC, and physical. So that's the importance of knowing those uh, protocol because we need to understand where are these protocols happening no? in the layer of the network. So you have the user protocol and then you have the control protocol. So uh, usually the, the physical MAC, RLC, and PDCP are same in the user protocol and the control plane protocol. And there is an added protocol, the SDAP, okay, in the 5G, okay, the service... Uh, a data adaptation protocol and the NAS for the UE uh, that is connecting go directly to the core network once you establish your connection. Okay, so this is the 5G uh, protocol stack. So why we are studying this now? Because uh, when if, if uh, when 5G uh, will be if 5G will be deployed and then we will be using the what we call the RU CU DU split. Okay, so what is this RUDU split uh, concept? So remember the the basic uh, uh, architecture of a 5G or 4G network. So you have the core network. Okay, you have the core network. You have the baseband unit and you have the radio unit. Okay, you still remember this? And the baseband unit is connected via backhole network. And the BBU is connected uh, via front hole network to the RRU. Okay. 
under the 3GPP approach, uh, technical reference 38.801, so they introduce what we call the network split or the RUCUDU split. The BBU functionality, the baseband functionality, is now separated into two. We call it the CU and the DU. Okay? So by splitting these functions across multiple units, so 5G network can be deployed in more flexible and scalable manner. Remember the um, this one, the cloud optimized architecture. Okay, so where we want to separate uh, some of the components of the five G network. So para tayo merong Lego system dito. Um, so we are separating first, no? The yung ating uh, base band unit into um, uh, two the centralized unit and the distributed unit and the RU is still the same no? so the radio unit okay so this is what we call the RU CDU splits now after splitting no we are we are splitting uh, the physical component of the baseband unit now it's time for us to split also the protocols okay so remember the protocol uh, previously um this one. Remember that the in the BBU, RRC, PDCP, RLC, MAC, and physical are located in the BBU. And RF is in the RRU. Okay. Now, what, what will happen if the BBU will be separated into two or will be split into centralized unit and distributed unit? <clears throat> So what will happen if we separate the BBU to the CUDU, the protocol will also be distributed. Okay? So previously, this one is uh, in one BBU, right? So now we are introducing the functional split options for 5G. So in the CU, there's a possibility that in the CU, uh, you can see the RRC or the PDCP or the high RLC or the low RLC. It depends on how the vendor or the operator wants to have the split. Where do they want to do the split? Okay, so if it's option two, the PDCP and the RRC protocol will be located in the CU. And the high RLC, low, high MAC, uh, low MAC, and the high physical will be on the DU. Okay, so you can see also the layer one functions, the layer two functions, and the layer three functions here. And if you look at uh some details in the di some details in the diagram is like this so the bbu previously is this one okay now separated into two centralized unit and the distributed unit and the centralized unit is divided into um, um control plane control plane and the user plane and then the du is now uh, equipped with the RLC, the MAC, and the high physical. Okay, so this is how the aggregation, this aggregation, meaning we are splitting the component, the hardware component, and also the protocols inside the, the components. So why is it important? Why do we need to separate this one? Remember, we have a different use cases in 5G. What are those? EMBB, URLLC, MMTC. These applications or use cases require different architecture structure. Okay. Especially for, like, for example, in the URLLC, where there is a need for a low latency communication, meaning, kinakailangan natin mabilis na response ng network. So, how do we do that? If your core network, like if your baseband or the cell site or the baseband unit is located 10 kilometers from you, now, even, even the, sabihin natin, the speed of light, there's still a delay now, that's, uh, uh, that is noticeable. So in order uh, for us to do that, we need to move some part of the network near to the users to increase or to reduce further the latency. Okay? So, that's why we are 
disaggregating the network. No, so we have a different uh, use case, uh, different uh, use cases and applications needed. So in this case, if we separate this uh, uh, a component, there will be another uh, interface. No, so previously uh, the connection between the RU and the DU we call it the front hole. And the CU and the, uh, the baseband and the core network, we call it the back hole. Now, since the baseband is separated into two, we have DU, distributed unit, and the centralized unit, we call it the mid hole. Okay, mid hole. So this is the connection be between the DU and the CU. And you can see here, these are the latency requirements for each um, interconnection, the maximum latency and the maximum distance no, that uh, can be covered. You can see that the, the CU and the DU can be located at the 20 to 40 kilometers apart. Well, the DU and the RU can be from one to 20 kilometers. So it's possible that your distributed unit is located in one building and your remote unit can be located on the other building. So that's possible no? as long as you satisfy this coverage requirement and latency requirement based on your applications. Okay. So, um, um, so why do we need to have a split? No? So these are the three factors for a run splitting. So there is a need to support specific quality of service for offered services. Just like I mentioned, your low latency. Uh, for URLLC, high throughput for EMBB, and real and non-real-time applications. There's also a specific uh, need for specific user density and low demand per given geographical area. There are areas that a lot of users, and there are areas that are very um, a few users. No? So there is a specific uh, support needed on this uh, type of applications. And uh, available transport networks with different performance level. So transmission network is expensive. No? So we need to optimize how we will use our transport network to uh, further uh, address some applications. So this is some a typical example from parallel wireless. So you can see the different splits now. Um, for open run, uh, the split that is recommended is the split seven. Okay, the split seven. And for applications like 2G and 3G, if you will do the splitting, it's uh, recommended to have the split eight. The split eight. So the split eight is a simplified, the uh, most simple, uh, uh, the simplest no? um, split that we can implement for 2G and 3G because the the services for 2G and 3G are not so complicated like the services in 4G and 5G where we can um, embed the circuits in the radio part. Okay, So if the functionalities are simple only, you can have simple circuit or microchips inside this RRU, okay, RF. So that's why in the 4G and 5G split 7, is one of the recommended uh, split type. Okay. All right. So that's our uh, 5G uh, discussion for for today. So it's a combination of of uh, simple concept going to some uh, deeper concept on 5G, and I hope uh, you were not so uh, so much uh, loaded with information. Okay, so let's continue our discussion with the RAN architecture. Okay. So RAN, as we call, uh, as we uh, as we uh, discussed earlier, uh, radio access network, this is the critical component of wireless communication system, right? So it provides coverage and connectivity to mobile devices. So there are, there, there are several different RAN architectures available today. Uh, and each of them has a unique strength and trade-offs. So ultimately, the choice of RAN architecture will depend on the range of factors. So it may include a uh, specific use case or network topology and available resources and the performance requirements. 
So operators can optimize their network performance, improve efficiency, and uh, deliver high speed, uh, low latency, and high reliability data transfer. Okay, as required by 5G applications. So RAN also evolves. So we're now uh, discussing about the evolution of radio access network. So this is a different set of evolution uh, because the, the first evolution that we have discussed is the 1G to 5G. Now we are talking about the uh, evolution, particularly of the radio access network architecture. Um, first, we have this, what we call the traditional network. We call it the DRAN. Okay. <clears throat> The DRAN or the distributed RAN. So we call it also the traditional network. So if you hear something about DRAN, we are referring to traditional network. DRAN means distributed RAN. So why is it called distributed? So this is the traditional uh, RAN architecture that has been used for many years. Kasi mula pa nung dineploy yung mga unang technology like 2G, up to LTE, no? meron pa tayong DRAN yan. Actually, sa Pilipinas, is most of our deployments are DRAN or the traditional network. Okay? So, it consists of separate baseband, okay? Baseband units and radio units which are connected via dedicated fiber or copper cables. And, uh, yeah, so the the cell sites or the, radio, the baseband and the RRU are located in the cell site premises. So, so, so same like this, no? Yan. This is a distributed run. So, yung ating mga baseband unit, okay, yung ating mga baseband units, radio units are located inside the premises of the cell site. So, we call it the distributed run because we are distributing no? yung mga run sa iba't ibang locations no? ng ating mga cell sites. So that is the traditional network. And then it evolves into a centralized network. Yeah. A centralized network uh, in this architecture, uh, it emerged in response to the need for more flexible and cost-effective solutions. So it uses a centralized processing unit to support a multiple remote uh, radio heads. Okay, which are connected via high-speed fiber optic links. Okay, and uh, this approach can help to reduce cost and improve network efficiency. So what what happened here is that the baseband unit, previously located at the premises, no, in the premises of the cell site, now located in a central office, nakapool na siya. So we call it the baseband pool. And in some terminologies or some References, you will uh, read it as a baseband hotel. So we are having some jokes in the in the RF engineering. Buti parawang baseband in a hotel. <laughs> so we have some baseband hotel. Okay. Yeah. So those uh, basebands are pulled together in the central office. So for the ease of uh, maintenance. Okay. And of course, uh, this is also using. A fiber optic and uh, some of the fiber we call it dark fiber uh yung mga spare ng mga operators they are using it no, to connect this uh um 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 are used uh, to the baseband pool okay so the bbus are pulled in the centralized location and the site only has the antennas and the ru and the bbu ru and interface are proprietary if you see um, yung mga protocols niyan is uh, still uh, under the uh, control ng, operate, ng, ano, ng existing vendors natin. And then, uh, it became virtualized network. Yan. Okay? Virtualized network. So, virtualized network in this architecture uh, builds on the benefits of the CRAN. Actually, it's a CRAN as well. But uh, it's a different case na, no? it adds the virtualization technology okay, to further improve efficiency and scalability. Um, by using a software-defined uh, networking and network function virtualization, so meron tayong separate uh, discussion about 
SDN and NFV Technologies uh, under Open Run pa rin yan, uh, under Asia Open Academy pa rin yan. And it creates a virtual network functions that can be uh, rapidly deployed and scale as needed. Just imagine last time, that is, uh, so traditional network, like for, for example, no, I will uh, activate uh, additional capacity or additional carrier of LTE. What I need to do, the site engineer needs to go to the, B, to the premises ng cell site, insert the board, or like for example, the additional LTE board to activate that carrier. So kailangan niya pumunta pa sa site. So he needs to go um, in the cell site premises. And then centralized network, ang uh, mangyari kung kailangan nating mag-upgrade ng site, so the engineers don't need to go in the cell site premises. Saan siya pupunta? Dito na lang sa central office where he can upgrade, okay? Okay, switch sa boards no dun sa pinaka central office and then activate the LTE. So, but this time here dahil virtualized sa tayo, <clears throat> if the <coughs> operator wants to increase capacity or to direct traffic, no? Uh, he can do it without physical intervention dun sa equipment. He can use also virtualization only. Just a pra, uh, adding command only. And then create a new instance of the network. And then if the if that instance is not needed anymore, you can just delete it. Okay, so ganun yun. Para kang, just imagine it uh, like an app in your phone. For example, you want to listen in the, the Spotify. No? What do you want to, what, what you will do? No? You will get your smartphone, download the app, okay, download the app, uh, install the Spotify, and then listen to the music. Now, if you don't want to listen anymore, and then you want to delete that app, just click the delete. So that's how uh, flexible it became. So that that kind of concept is being applied in the telecom world. And then we call it the virtualization. Okay? So the the, the main challenge here is that uh, the software is still proprietary with virtualized function. So you can still, uh, the, the product is still proprietary coming from the different vendors. And the interconnection is still proprietary. Okay, so that's how the the virtualized network is happening. You can install the software or configure the software in the COTS hardware, okay? Commercial off-the-shelf hardware. You can buy a server and then install those uh, uh, virtualized function there. But the interconnection is still proprietary. Okay, so it's still not open. Okay, so it's proprietary interface pa rin. And then the open run. Okay, so the open run now we have the core network. Your baseband unit is now separated into centralized unit and the distributed unit. And then you have the radio unit. Okay, so there is a separation. The, the functionality is already split. And then the cloud native network functions and the GPP hardware, meaning you're also using. A GPP, general purpose hardware or COTS hardware, and the uh, software defined networks and the interfaces are open, meaning you can mix and match different vendors to the different uh, vendors of the RU to the CU or the DU. Okay, so this is how the open run is different from the virtualized run. Okay, so you remove the proprietary. Um, uh, factor no dun sa mga equipment natin that's uh, how the open run differs from the dif from this uh, different radio access network okay <clears throat> so ano ba yung mga cots no when we talk about cots so pag sinabi nating cots so it's commercial off the shelf so it's a software term for software products that are ready made and available for purchase. And the BBU gets replaced by COTS server rather than being proprietary BBU hardware. Previously, uh, so that you can also relate now, if you want to, if you want to buy a radio 
you want to listen to FM uh, or AM radio previously, you need to buy a radio. Right? Buy a radio, physical radio with an antenna. And then you tune it and then you listen to your favorite station. Okay. Now, you can listen to radios or FM radio particularly, even though it was just a simple application only and then connected to the server or to, to application server, no? nung, nung radio station na yon. So you don't need to buy the radio. You can just have the phone and then install the software there so you can use and then uh, um, enjoy the benefits of the functionality ng radio. Ganun din nangyayari dito sa, ano, sa, sa open run. So you don't need to buy the the baseband unit. You just buy uh, a COT server and then just configure it of the functionality of the baseband function that you, you want to implement in your network. Okay? And proprietary interfaces between radios and COTS base remain as they are. Okay? And uh, yeah, so you can connect different vendor of RRU to different vendor of BBU. So that's how the uh, flexibility of open run is now. Uh, when we uh, try to uh, see some application like this, no, some testings, na mga open run uh, system, uh, you can see in the test systems that the, there's a separate BBU and that there are different RRUs that they are testing if it is uh, working, you know, interoperable to each other. And sometimes there's a one RRU and then you connect a CU. You can check the different CU to check the, the interoperability. So, pinetest nila yung mga interoperability ng bawat vendors isa isa. So, that's one of the applications niyan. Okay. <clears throat> So now we're going uh, deeper na no? papunta sa radio access network na sa open run no. So what ano ba talaga ang open run? What is open run? And why we are why we are uh, starting to study and introducing open run particularly here in the Philippines and uh, in other parts of the country. Okay. Um usually there are major challenges na no? sa telco world. Particularly mga telco operator um, three major challenges is that first is the faster time to market. So it includes the faster rollout for new features, services, and capabilities. So like, for example, we have to deploy 5G. So if you want to deploy it faster, so we need to have a mechanism or a technology or a way uh, of deployment na mas mabilis no? natin may deliver yung services sa ating mga subscribers. And uh, deploying a new technology will have a significant investments in new networking technologies. And as well as there is a need for flexibility. Um, there are radios or equipment that are like, for example, can only be used for this kind of purpose, no specific purpose equipment. <laughs> okay. So there are equipment that are, that are only capable of LTE. There are equipment that are uh, cannot be upgraded anymore. Okay. So flexibility is not there. Next is better performance. So it uh, um, evolves during the pandemic. Uh, when people start to stay at home and then work, work from home. Okay. There's a lot of, no, no, there's a lot of uh, uh, capacity demand happening. So for operators, they need to expand and improve the system capacities. This one. And better coverage. So if people are staying uh, indoors nowadays, uh, so <clears throat> we need to improve the coverage. And improving the coverage and enhancing the capacity, so we know that there's an impact in the quality, right? So that's the triangle of uh, the design. You have the coverage, the have the capacity, and then you have the quality. These are the three that you are balancing if you are or if you are in the radio network designing. Even though you have a good coverage, if the capacity is not enough, so your network is not good. If you have good, good coverage 
And then you want to increase the capacity, but increasing the capacity means you need to add more frequencies in your network. And then it will introduce interference. So quality will suffer. Okay. Now there's a, there's a fourth dimension on this uh, design. There's the dimension of C, another C, which is cost. Okay. So whenever you are, you are designing a network, you don't need, you just don't need to consider the coverage, the capacity, the quality. Of course, you need to consider the cost. Okay. So that's the fourth fourth dimension in the designing process. Also, yeah, so lower cost, so cut in energy consumption, uh, equipment uh, cost must be lower and reduce the capex and the opex. When we say capex, capex means capital expenditure. So if you buy, if you build the new site, you need to buy new equipment. Okay, if you buy a new equipment, that cost is considered capex. Okay, if you build a network, you want the services of RF engineers, you want the services of optimization engineers, you want the services of uh, of drive test engineers. So that's also a service cost under capex. Now, once the site is uh, already up, okay, and then you need maintenance, okay power, uh, cost, cost of electricity, cost of gasoline, that goes to the OPEX, operational expense, okay? Operational expense. So when you're trying to compute the feasibility of uh, a cell site or a network in a certain area, um, sometimes you have to call the payback period, right? So the payback period is uh, simple math only, simple formula of doing this is that you have your capex okay you have your capex divided by <clears throat> you have your revenue minus your opex okay so in this case you can calculate how much time you need to recover your capex based on the revenue. That's why um, building a cell site takes a lot of strategy, good strategy and careful planning because there might be some sites that might be, that might have negative payback period. What does it mean? If you have a negative payback period, meaning your capex is somewhat high, but your revenue is lower than your OPEX, meaning the amount of uh, money that's coming in is very less or less than the operational expenses. That's why your payback period is negative already, meaning you cannot recover anymore the money that you spent in building that cell site. Okay, so that's uh, one of the considerations here. That's why um, many operators are considering to lower their CAPEX and lower also the OPEX. Okay, so Open Run promises to lower these two, CAPEX and OPEX. Okay? <clears throat> okay. So last, uh, what date is this? Uh, last, I think 2021, quarter one of 2021. I need to update this slide. Uh, worldwide market shares. Um 29% of the worldwide market share in the Q1 of 2021, uh, Huawei is the is uh, getting 29% of the market share. Ericsson has 15%, Nokia has 15%, ZTE has 11 and Samsung has 3 Okay, so the 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 equipment coming from from the antenna to the radio unit to the the baseband unit. Okay, currently are supplied by single vendor. So you cannot see that uh, the radio unit is supplied by a vendor H and then the BBU is supplied by vendor E. It's not happening in our network today. Uh, usually what's happening is uh, you buy all the equipment in the run in one vendor. Okay. Uh, because it's uh, um, proprietary. 
because the protocols here will not talk <laughs> to to the protocol uh, implemented by vendor E to compare to vendor H, right? So that's uh, what we call the vendor lock-in, okay? And those link, these equipments are inseparably you know, link set of proprietary hardware and software components, okay? So this is what's happening right now. So the principle of open run uh, goes like this. So you have the core network and the hardware and software, which is already happening in the IT world. So this is the manifestation of the broader technology move. We call it the disaggregation. And in the IT world, it's already observed many years ago. It, it already happened in the IT world. Uh, disaggregation and run means splitting of the system into smaller subsystems. And then disaggregation means separation of the hardware and the software. As you can see in the previous uh, slides in the 5G that we have that that we have uh, discussed earlier, right? So we separate the hardware, the CU and the DU and the RU, and then we separate also the protocol to each uh, corresponding uh, hardwares. Okay. And for Open RAN, we focus on the disaggregation of the radio access network. Open RAN. Okay, so this is what, ha what will happen. For the open run disaggregated, the uh, open run is, is also called as disaggregated run. Okay, so in our, our current scenario, we have the core network and traditional network or traditional run. And then you have the core network. What will happen in the, in the traditional run? Okay, what will happen in the traditional run is that there will be an... Um, a use of the GPP hardware, okay? The, the hardware will be open source. And then the software will be open source. And the interfaces will be open also so that you can interconnect different equipment from vendor A to vendor B, vendor B to vendor A. And importantly, the network will be um, energized by run intelligent controller or the RIC, okay? So the run intelligent controller. Okay, so it, so for a, for a network to become an open run, it has an open interfaces enabling multi-vendor run, okay? A virtualized run software running on a generic IT, increasing the flexibility, um, splitting the different functions in the different base station, and uh, powered by an intelligent uh, system like the run intelligent controller. Okay. Okay. So what oh, what is open run? So open run means open radio access network. So this is an industry movement. Okay, that develops this aggregated and interoperable radio access network solutions leveraging on the general purpose processors or GPP hardware and software defined technologies and open interfaces based on industry standards, okay? So that's uh, Open RAN. No? So, so one of the benefits of Open RAN uh, is the diverse vendor ecosystem, more competitive supplier environment, fast network uh, deployment, um, access to third-party software developers, automation, okay, powered by the artificial intelligence and the uh, machine learning, okay, um, I, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and uh, lower TCO, you know, total cost of ownership because of the uh, RU white box, radio unit white box, COD server, and uh, CICD and reduce time to market and time of deployment and reduce equipment maintenance costs. So what are the drivers of open run? Um, because of the growing demand, uh, network demand, uh, network virtualization, artificial intelligence, the use of artificial intelligence and machine learning and big data and 5G use cases. Also, of course, there's uh, challenges no? uh, when deploying open run. It's not, uh, it's not all benefits. 
So the common concern regarding the open run is the ability to match performance of proprietary hardware platforms. So some recent uh, lab trials and live deployments addressed at the end of the uh, ad address as uh, the proof that open run is meeting performance objectives. Next is uh, fault management. Okay, so when something goes wrong in the network, isolating the component that is the source of the problem can be more complex in an open run environment. So to solve this problem, uh, the network management tools have been developed for open run. So it contributes to root cause, the an root cause analysis and speedy uh, issue resolution. Of course, network automation. So to fully realize the benefits of open run and to manage complexity, operators must invest in cloud management technologies and extreme automation, including the orchestration and the zero touch provisioning. And of course, if it's a new movement, new equipment, new protocols, okay, new interfaces, new architectures, uh, we need to understand the open run ecosystem. Especially for us engineers, one of the biggest enhancements to the open run is the end of the vendor lockdown age, right? So if you are uh, familiar with the existing vendors right now, and then there's a lot of players coming in, so there's a need uh, to learn those uh, equipment, right? So different new New vendors are appearing to supply hardware and software for each element on the network. And then there's the run intelligent controller. So it's important that everybody or everyone involved uh, is aware of all the new hardware and software that currently exists, as well as all the providers. Okay. So for this issue, uh, several initiatives were born to help companies understand and begin in this journey. Like, for example, what Asia Open Run Academy is doing. And this one is for new team profiles. Okay, so in Open Run, the lines between the world of telecommunications and the world of IT are blurred. So they are overlapping, they start to overlap, like overlap, not on the extent of Milky Way and Andromeda Galaxy. Yeah. <laughs> it's starting to overlap. No, uh, this implies that the roles. Of uh, and responsibilities defined so far within the world of mobile networks change with the arrival of Open Run. So you can see here now that, you are, that a, a telecom engineer is now studying virtualization, artificial intelligence, and machine learning, software defined networking. And the IT guys are starting to understand the radio environment. Okay propagation, antenna concept, uh, cable losses, link budget. You know? Because there is some uh, merging of those two industries. So we highly recommend that you become a hybrid as well. So if you are familiar with the telco, you start to study more on the IT. And if you're on the IT, you need to uh, learn about telecommunications. So when it became full blown, especially here in the Philippines or in abroad, you are ready, you are prepared, okay? Okay, so these are, are some uh, typical hardware, a GPP hardware, uh, low-cost radio access network or white box hardware used in the open run. Uh, so this is uh, one example coming from Ranathon, okay? So this is a white box hardware, the first two. A computer hardware such as servers or networking equipment that is assembled using a one uh, off-the-shelf component instead of proprietary parts. So we call it the white box hardware. So it will be based on the Oran specified open front hole interface and split seven uh, dash two x. Okay. Um, application typical applications is in the R O R U and the O D U and the front hole gateway. So the front hole gateway will be implemented like this. So this is uh, coming from the Lions technology. No? So you have the BBU, and then you have the front hole gateway. And then you have the maximum 8 RU per cell. So it looks like it's a typical example of an, no, a small cell application, if you're familiar with the small cells application. It's still uh, uh, almost 
have a eight RU per cell. Okay. So this is a typical example of a low cost hardware uh, solution no, from Lions Technology. Okay. Uh, now we go for we go to the open run ecosystem. Okay, so we'll discuss about the different uh, open run groups and initiatives uh, supporting the open run ecosystem. First is the Telecom Info Project, the Oran Alliance, and the other key open run groups such as the Open Run Software Community, Small Cell Forum, uh, Open Run uh, Policy Coalition. So let's start with the Telecom Info Project or the TIP. So Telecom Info Project is uh, one of the two industry groups uh, spearheading uh, the Open Run Initiative. So TIP was founded by, in 2016 by Facebook or Meta right now as an engineering focus collaborative technique for designing and implementing global telecom network infrastructure with the objective of allowing universal access to the internet. Okay. So, hindi lang pang social media si Facebook. No? So, they are also involved in this uh, initiative of supporting uh, Open Run. And if, if you go to their website, there is what we call the Open Run Project Group. Okay. So, the member companies host technology incubators and accelerators. Uh, CTIP are, uh, is hosting an annual infrastructure conference uh, known as yung TIP Summit. Mayroon sila tinatawag ng mga ano, ano ng mga um, plug fest. So plug fest means uh, meron kang equipment, you have the equipment. You have, for example, you have the DU and then meron kang CU. So you bring your CU, you bring your DU and then let's try to interconnect. No? Let's plug it together if they uh, if they will work. No, uh, if they have a uh, inter interoperability testing. So ayun yung mga plug fest na ginagawa natin. And then they also have this open run group, open run project group. So this is an initiative to define and build 2G, 3G, 4G, and 5G run solutions based on general purpose vendor neutral hardware, open interface, and software. So that is TIP, no? Telecom Info Project. Next is the Oran Alliance. So Oran Alliance, uh, nabuo siya after two years in uh, ni TIP in February 2018 with the goal of promoting open and intelligent run. So this is the second group or organization driving the open run movement. So meron tayong dalawang organization that merged to form the Oran Alliance. Uh, first is the CIRAN, the China Mobile and other mainly uh, Chinese vendors, CIRAN Alliance, and the XRAN, uh, NDT Docomo and other uh, American vendors. So, ang mga um, founding operators niyan ng Oran Alliance is um, si AT&T, China Mobile, Deutsche Telekom, NTT Docomo, and Orange. Okay? So, ayan si Oran Alliance. So, si Oran Alliance, siya yung gumagawa ng mga technical specifications and uh, guidelines, no? And the mga use cases. So if you look at the Oran Technical Work Group, so meron siyang katulad ng 3GPP, uh, meron siya iba't ibang work group, hanggang work group 11, so sa bawat architecture ng Oran, uh, Oran Architecture, meron work group na tumututok doon to set the specifications and standards. Okay? So meron tayong mga different uh, um um parts of the Oran architecture. Okay, so meron tayong orchestration and automation, yung SMO. And then we have this uh, run intelligent controller, which pag-usapan natin to sa, ano, sa next session natin, next week. Um, nandiyan yung CUDU, and then yung mga interfaces, papuntang ODU and ORU. So ito yung simplified form ng uh, architecture ng isang Oran uh, architecture. Uh, you have the SMO, okay, where the non-real-time RIC is located. And then nandito yung ating near-real-time RIC or the Run Intelligent Controller. Nandiyan yung ating mga X-App, okay. And then you have the OCU, the ODU, the ORU, and the O-Cloud. 
So kapag tinig mo yan, sa nasan yung core network diyan, no? So yung core network nandito, no, syempre. So itong OCU natin nakakonekta sa core network. Yan. So it's either um LTE or 5G core network. Yan. Na nakakonekta sa core network syempre. Tas ito, syempre, may connect, may interconnection din to, no. Kaya kaya kapag uh, naputol yung connection natin dito sa dalawang tong, sa SMO at saka sa near real time rate the system can still work right it can still work because it's it's still connected the only difference is that the intelligence uh, given by the run intelligent controller will be diminished okay so pag-uusapan natin daw we'll discuss this further in the second session next week the deep dive into the oran uh, architecture um so the oran alliance membership Uh, are say, are divided into two so it's either an operator members or vendors or researcher or academic institutions or contributors that uh, want to contribute in a meaningful way to the Oran Alliance so marami mga members ng Oran Alliance no yan so sila sila rin yung mga vendors isa isa diyan si Rakuten Mobile okay from Japan and here are the other uh, um, contributors and academic uh, entities. So ayun si ano no si Oran Alliance. Next is um Oran. Yes, Huawei is not uh, there no. Um Oran Software Community. Okay, so the Oran Software Community is a collaboration between the Oran Alliance and the Linux Foundation with the goal of promoting Um, the development of open source software of runs. So the Oran Software Community's mission is to enhance the openness of the radio access network by focusing on openness uh, of the radio access network by focusing on the open interfaces followed by implementation uh, that utilize, that utilize uh, new capabilities allowed by Oran standards. Okay, so sa software ang ginagawa nito, no? Oran Software Community. And then we also have this uh, other key open grant group, the Open Network Foundation or the ONF. This is an operator-driven community uh, led non-profit consortium fostering yung mga democratizing the innovation in software-defined programmable networks. So you can check the website here para makita niyo yung mga uh, ginagawa nila. And meron silang specific product what we call this uh, SD run. So this is building an open source components for the mobile run space and complementing yung mga open run focus on architecture interfaces. And then meron isang group which is a small cell forum uh, develop its open run environment with small cells in mind. Small cells uh, like what I showed you uh, previously uh, implemented in the indoor system but this one the small cells are not being done like uh, the distributed antenna system no they are using a uh, a different cable and an active antenna system but the concept is the same okay so just imagine yung rru functionality pinagsama natin sa ano no, sa antenna so that's the small cell solution so the one that is uh, contributing to that um uh, um Um, deployment type is the small cell forum or the SCF. Okay. And lastly is the open run policy coalition. So it collects, uh, it's a collection of firms created to support the policies that would accelerate the adoption. Okay. So this is one of the ch ano yun, um, challenges ay yung adoption ng mga operators to implement Uh, open run. So, ang goal nila is to fund research and development, okay? Remove the barriers to the 5G deployment, avoid the heavy-handed or prescriptive solutions, and of course, use the government procurement to support vendor diversity and signal government support for open and interoperable solutions. and support global de de development of open and interoperable wireless technologies. So, uh, itong kagandaan kay Open Run Policy Coalition. No? So, they are 
supporting in terms of the policy uh, making bodies no so din in encourage na mga government to uh, somewhat uh, give incentives no sa mga vendors or operators that want to implement open run okay so ito yung ating mga um major no uh, open run groups and initiatives pero may mga ano pa to no marami pa tong kasama no pero what we have discussed so far is the major ones Okay, now let's go to the last part, no? Yung deployments and trials. So, ano yung mga deployment uh, scenarios, no? For open run. So, since the system would be open, the equipment, the hardware, the software, and the interfaces are open, not like the proprietary. So, what are the different um, uh, deployment scenarios? So, we can implement, of course, a typical typical uh, network deployment, no? for coverage extension and site densification. But of course, for us, uh, RF engineers and optimization engineers, we see a diff, uh, challenge when you are deploying open run in a densified network. Like for example, you have an existing network here, no? Meron kang network dyan. And then you try to put an open run here. <laughs> okay, so open run to. So what will happen if you're familiar with the neighbor definition, it will be different. No? They will treat this as a different network because of the equipment. If this is a proprietary coming from vendor from vendor H, okay, and then you have a vendor M here, there's a different protocol here. And then there's a possibility that there's a challenge in definition of the neighbor. So that's one of the... Um, challenges but you can still deploy because we are doing this uh, we are doing this also in the existing network eh? especially in the boundaries in the boundaries of uh, the philippines okay a uh, new deployment in urban and suburban okay uh, and system replacements and upgrades so if you want to change out the equipment but uh, we know no that the that the task of system replacement is very huge especially for rf engineers and optimization implementation like for example the system of replacement is that uh, one network will change the equipment from vendor a to vendor b that's a huge task okay actually even though it's a small area it's a still huge task okay from planning to implementation but we can deploy like that and also for rural coverage, okay? So if you want to expand coverage, it's better. Mm -hmm. Better to have uh, use an open run. And also if you are, if you are uh, a green uh, uh, green field network, no? like uh, Rakuten Mobile. So when they deploy the network, since uh, they are a green field uh, operator, uh, they can deploy immediately. Uh, open run immediately. No? So there is no combination of different hardwares uh, and software or different vendors. And then you can also support private and neutral host networks. So you can deploy open run, like for example, you have a factory in 5G, you want to create a 5G private network, you can have an open run here. Okay, you can deploy open run. Or you are a neutral host network like for example in the tower sharing solutions this is a typical example ah. tower sharing solutions and then you're located in the rural area why don't you just uh, not, not just only share the tower but share the antenna system including the radio and the BBU or the CUDU no? so this is open okay where different operators or when different operator can share the entire antenna system and the radio access network by using uh, open run. Okay, so that's one of the uh, deployment uh, scenarios. Okay, so what are the different deployment and trials? So, marami na sa iba't ibang bansa, but the most um, successful and uh, famous deployment is the Rakuten mobile in Japan. So they are greenfield in 4G deployment. Uh, their equipment is Altiostar and Nokia. And uh, NEC selected for 5G deployment. 
so intended to reduce the OPEX. So if you visit the Rakuten uh, Symphony or mobile website, you can see uh, uh, the different benefits that they gathered or gained in deploying Open Run in their network. And in other parts of the world, like AT&T, Verizon, T-Mobile, Deutsche Telekom, Dish in the US, okay, MTN, Telefonica, Vodafone, they are starting to test and some of them are implementing Open RAN. Um, deployment trials uh, um, done by Parallel Wireless. So you can see different vendors aside from the traditional vendors or current uh, players right now. So there are new players in the likes of Parallel Wireless, Mavenir. Okay, so you will hear this voice, uh, this uh, <laughs> this. Uh, um, vendors. So if you're um, interested to learn more about them, you just visit their website. So what they are, what are their projects? Okay. So they have different uh, trials uh, and deployments in different parts of the world, like in Mozambique, uh, Ireland, India, and Turkey. Same with Parallel Wireless. Uh, they have some deployment also in and trials in Colombia, South uh, Latin America. Peru and Argentina. Uh, for Mavenir, Altio Star, Telefonica uh, here in Brazil, Germany, Spain, and UK. Okay, so those are the uh, deployment uh, uh, trials now of uh, Open RAN. Okay. All right, so yeah, we are just in time. So we'll uh, end this session with the key learning points. Okay, so what we have learned so far before we uh, uh, go to the question and answer and post-test. So our key learning points for today's session is uh, RAN. Don't forget this, please. <laughs> RAN means radio access network. Okay, RAN is part of the cellular mobile network that gives mobile coverage. Uh, open RAN means open radio access network. And open RAN is an industry movement to develop uh, disaggregated and interoperable radio access network solutions using general purpose processors, GPP, software defined technologies, and open interfaces. So, the main driving forces of Open RAN are growing network demand, network virtualization, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and big data, and of course, 5G use cases. And the following are the benefits of Open RAN reduced costs broader supplier ecosystem, faster innovation, faster deployment. One of the most crucial challenges to ensure deployment readiness is the system integration. And the two major run groups and initiatives are Telecom Info Project and ORAN Alliance. And the open run deployment scenarios are site densification, coverage extension, greenfield deployments in urban, suburban, system replacement, um, and support of private and neutral host networks. And open run trials and deployments have been done in different parts of the world. 